Hello, and welcome back to Communicate Like You Give a Damn. I'm your host, Kim Clark, and with me today is Jessica. I can't wait to, wait for you to get to know Jessica and her book, her new book, and we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about here. Jessica, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Kim. Hi, everyone. I am Jessica Bantam. I'm a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging consultant, and also an interior design consultant. Uh, and I merged those two uh, backgrounds into my new book, Design for Identity, How to Design Authentically for a Diverse World. You know what? Let's start with the book. First of all, it is beautiful, which I guess one expects. Was that a lot of pressure as a designer to design a beautiful book? It was. And I actually, I'm so glad that I found a publisher that had access to great designers because I knew that if I tried to even start on my own, <laughs> That would be the delay for the book. I had the book written. It would have been all about figuring out the cover <laughs> and the interior layout. So, I was so glad I was able to outsource that. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. All right. So one of, you have it in the title, Design for Identity. Now, when you're talking about identity, what are you referring to? That's, I'm so glad you asked about that. When I, when I talk about identity, I want to be sure that people understand that it's addressing the many elements that make up who we are, um, the many dimensions of humanity. So that can range from uh, race, gender, and ethnicity, which I think people's minds generally go to first. Uh, but it can go beyond that to religion, age, socioeconomic status, um, ability, and even more, I mean, body size, there's just so many things that are tied to who we are. And it can even go to uh, where we're from. And, you know, I, I always represent Philly wherever, <laughs> wherever <laughs> I am. Well, I, I, too. <laughs> yeah, I accidentally uh, continue to identify California wherever I go with the amount of avocado toast that this white woman right here <laughs> consumes on a regular basis. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, you know, identity, I also think about it as, a, as it relates to organizations or brands. And so how do you, in your work, how do you manage through that with individual identities, but also like brand identities? It's interesting. It comes up in a lot of different ways. So one thing that um, I, I tell people and organizations actually to keep in mind is that to address identity, period, you have to start from a personal standpoint. Mm. Um, we have to, in order to really comprehend all the things that make up other people's identities, uh, we have to be willing to face our own. And I find often that that's, that's a usual, uh, a common hang up for people. That they're, they wrestle so much with who they are that they can't really learn to appreciate difference. Um, and mm. they find they take so much so much issue and, and find so much discomfort in being challenged by things that are outside their own frame of reference, that that's often where the whole identity conversation start, it stops actually. Um, so there has to be some willingness to kind of, to lean in from an individual standpoint, to really evaluate identity and what it means to us. And then collectively as organizations to also have that conversation, just like you said, in terms of brand, uh, you know, what do we stand for how do we show up in the world? Um, how are we, we making sure that our clients have a consistent experience, um, no matter who they encounter, you know, from within the organization? Um, and there are so many things that that even comprise that. You know, you can't talk about the whole collective identity also without acknowledging the different identities among the workforce. Um, so it, it has definitely has to cut across all of those different uh, dimensions for an organization too. I'm really glad you brought that up because one of the things that uh, I do with a lot of my clients who look like me, whether they're male or female or everything on and off the continuum, is that there's such a lack of understanding of our own heritage. Mm. And to fill that void, we steal everybody else's culture, customs, traditions, food, music, you know, et cetera. And we, but we don't necessarily make that connection. That's something that we just, we're doing a lot of projection of what other people should be feeling that we are um, acknowledging somebody else's culture. You should be happy that we're doing that. 
right? Enter Gwen Stefani. Um, but <laughs> then there's the other part where it's like, actually, I'm putting everything out on everybody else. It's called projection. And I'm not taking a look at my own self, my own lack of understanding or, or um, awareness or connection to my own heritage, which is which kind of filters into this cultural conversation with that we have within the workplace. So I'm curious if you've run into situations or if you have any advice for communicators, designers, et cetera, when an issue of cultural appropriation can arise when it comes to design. Definitely, definitely. I'm glad you bring that up too, because cultural appropriation happens in any place where there is design happening for people without people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it, it is often the case, especially in an industry that's as homogenous as the design industry is. Um, I believe even now it's only, it's 90% white. Um, as you know, you think of the implications of a population that has so little diversity designing for a mm -hmm. diverse world. So there's automatically going to be that lens that is applied to everything. Even if you're trying to do your best to honor identity, you can't really do it without connection with people of that identity. Um, that's one of the things that I, I really try to drive home in my book. Uh, but cultural appropriation is what happens when there is that lack of connection, when it's all about an interpretation of what other people might find meaningful. <laughs> um, and like I said, the missing part of that is the actual connection, the actual conversation, asking people what is relevant to you? What, what about your identity would you like to celebrate and how would you do that? Uh, that's how you go from cultural appropriation to cultural appreciation um, and coming up with something that is really authentic and something that really does honor humanity and identity. You use a perfect example with Louis Vuitton uh, in the book. Speak to that example and what is our takeaway as designers and communicators? Because communicators were involved in this as well, content creators uh, in, in the messaging and the copy uh, of this. So share with us the, the example and what we need to take away from it. Sure. There was an example, I believe this was in, in 2021, uh, where Louis Vuitton, was they wanted to create a sweater that honored Jamaican heritage. And their initial design incorporated the colors in red, yellow, and green. And the colors of the Jamaican flag are actually yellow, green, and black. Um, and there was instant uproar, you know, from people who understand that that is a difference. There is a distinction there, especially because um, there are often connections between Jamaican heritage and Rastafarianism, which is represented typically by, by red, yellow, and green. Um, and it was interesting to see <laughs> the copy, just as you mentioned, um, was originally identifying this as something to honor Jamaican heritage. When there was pushback, when there was controversy, they attempted to change, <laughs> once again, the, the copy, but still didn't do that in an accurate way either. So it was kind of just like, just, just make it worse. Just keep making it worse. <laughs> and ultimately, of course, the item was pulled it was no longer available for sale. And there are so many things that happen in those moments. One, among design teams, like who didn't catch this? Right. You know, where, yeah. where was the conversation? Um, who was involved in the conversation? Who was or was not in the room for the design process? And then also to your point in terms of communication, like that's a whole other opportunity for someone to have caught it there. Um, and then there was yet another opportunity <laughs> yep. once this came to light and once it was out in the world, once it was, you know, everywhere on social media uh, to address it from a, a, a standpoint that could really honor people just and communicating like you give, you give a damn, right? Like, let's, let's own this. We messed up. We got it wrong. You know, we apologize, not we apologize if anyone's feelings were hurt. We apologize. Right. We offended people. And this is how we should have represented it. Um, and there's all so many opportunities there that were missed and harm is done in the process of, of communicating and, and uh, or not communicating in those ways where we're actually accounting for people's identity, what resonates with them, what is actually culturally accurate <laughs> and making sure that that is what we go out with the first time. And it, it, it's really a reflection of our systems and our processes, right? So if we don't have the right team, if we don't have the right relationships, either internally or externally, 
and people don't have a voice. Maybe somebody did see it, but they didn't have the psychological safety to say something, right? Or didn't have access. So there was an equitable inequitability of access to to the decision maker to say, Hey, we need to, we need to, we need to take a right turn here. Um, and what that feedback looks like. And so to have the exact same team go out and kind of do crisis comms around it and say, well, this is what we intended, but not own and take responsibility of the impact because what it was doing, it was reflecting on the systems and processes that they have in place, which includes the makeup of the team and the relationships that they have that they can't, they don't have the right to go out and create a product and benefit financially off of a culture that they actually don't have basic knowledge about. So that it is a larger cultural conversation of really, you know, understanding what appreciation is and how do we incorporate ways to benefit the culture <laughs> rather than just the company. If you're going to go out there and try to make money off of somebody else's culture that you're not a part of. We have to extend the conversation. We have to bring them in. If you have anything else to add to that, and as well as let's look ahead. Juneteenth is coming. Walmart blew it big time last year. Uh, you can, you know, kind of refresh people's memory around that. I'll just say they made pride ice cream and that was a miss. So what are some ways that we can not be performative when it comes yeah. to design, especially our social media posts, our graphics? that you know and how we communicate especially around juneteenth definitely definitely and and there's so just so many things Um, (laughs) i know (laughs) one i will say that in each of these instances and the the ones i cited in my book and we're talking about the louis vuitton sweater in any of these instances i know there are people in the mix who either know that something's wrong Mm -hmm. they're not Mm -hmm. maybe they can't even put their finger on it people who really do know, and just like you said, do not feel like they're in a safe environment to speak of. And then some people who just don't care. And I- yeah, It's just about them. making money and this is what we're gonna do. And sometimes I, I'm curious, is this a PR play? Is this, is this a marketing way of just getting in the news and because you don't genuinely care about the impact, you're actually trying to create a mess. Um, you know, but what do you want to be known for? That's when I, whenever I work with executives, I'm like, so what legacy do you want to lead? So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And, and sadly enough, I think most times the people who don't care or, or don't care and don't know are the leaders who are making these final decisions. That's the problem. Uh, but this also all speaks to the importance of having diverse perspectives, diverse backgrounds, et cetera, on the actual teams themselves. And creating these environments where people can share from their lived experience in those moments so that these things never even get created in the first place. These Mm -hmm. things that do so much harm and have so much negative impact. Um, And, you know, you mentioned Juneteenth uh, as America is prone to do, you know, we, we commercialize everything. Um, And last year with it, with it being the first kind of formal recognition uh, nationwide recognition of Juneteenth. We saw things like Walmart coming up with their Juneteenth ice cream. And, and uh, you know, I saw party favors with things that said, like, it's the culture for me and things it, like... Party plates. It was reduced to party plates, reduced Jessica. To par- it, it, and it was said in little koozies. And th- what? That has nothing to do with the significance of this celebration. And it, it's... It makes me sad, but it also makes me think this is even more reason that we need to have people with diverse perspectives in the room when all of these ideas are even being floated out there to begin with. So that people can say, like, do you understand the message that you're sending by doing this? And there has to be that recognition to your point, too, that people of lived experience are encountering most anything with skepticism. Because it is this kind of thing like, oh, well, what are they going to do? <laughs> what are they going to do now? Um, and it's going, and it takes time to build that trust that whatever is being created is being done from a place of respect and appreciation. Um, and that is, it is being done with authenticity, um, which goes back to this need to have, have these different uh, lived experiences brought into the process itself. And also this need for connection with the actual people you're designing for to ask them what is relevant to them. 
what is really going to signify to you that this is something that is meant to to celebrate and not just to kind of check a box, um, not something to commercialize, not something to just, you know, come up with another reason to have a whole new brand, you know, brand of cards, a new line of Hallmark cards. Like, yeah, you know, it's true right. team. Um, we have to feel that there is, this is coming from a place of true honor um, and not just another ploy. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And you were talking about need. So when you were, when you, you, you must have seen some sort of a need in your industry, in your discipline, in order to write this book. What was that need and what was your approach that you took? Well, I would say definitely when I was in the classroom, when I was getting my design degree, uh, it hit me when I looked around at my, you know, the, my fellow classmates as I looked in the front of the room, that there, there was not enough representation in this this industry for us to for it to be on us as designers to design for everybody we have to have more diversity in the profession itself because otherwise it is going to be everything that's created is through this lens of this predominantly white industry yeah, the white gaze mm -hmm. yeah and so i mean even if you're saying oh, oh we're going to create this asian inspired space or this african inspired this or that it's still going to be through the lens of, <laughs> of white designers mm -hmm. And there, and it's not to say that they can't connect in some way with customers of different backgrounds, but there's just a different level of authenticity when it is being done from a place of shared experience. Um, so that was one realization I had just literally looking around the classroom and thinking like, who here is designing for me? I don't see any other black women here. And I don't know how you think you're figuring Jessica out. Um, <laughs> I don't get that. And then when I got into DEI formally, I saw that a lot of the conversation there is about internal operations. It's about recruiting, retention, um, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, a lot of the, the conversation interaction, the systems within an organization and how they work kind of as an ecosystem. But the conversation didn't really get into how we do what we do as professionals and how we interact with external stakeholders. Um, and to me, you can't do one without the other because once again, they, it becomes inauthentic. And the people that you're trying to connect most with will pick up on that right away. Mm -hmm. You know, to say, to go to your website and say, you know, we have, oh, you know, three black leaders, one brown leader, one openly gay leader. We did it. Like we get full spark. <laughs> no, we did not. <laughs> because the people in your organization of diverse backgrounds who have been marginalized for years and show up day in, day out, either feeling like they're not seen, valued, or heard that they don't have a chance to thrive in an organization because they can't even uh, really connect on a real meaningful level with their own managers. They don't care about your leadership page. They don't care about your corporate statement that you made in the summer of 2020 that you haven't gone back to or referred to since. We need real impactful change. And we do. it does still need to happen internally as well, but the way we live our values can also show up in what we do as professionals. And I'm wondering, even if we start there, that, you know, could it, could it then filter back in internally in a more meaningful way? You know, you can't have these conversations with customers and not have them with the person you sit next to every day. So just curious how that's, how that could potentially play out. And if this is expanding this lens on what it means to live the values of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, how that could potentially impact how we show up for each other. Showing up for each other, there is a uh, intrinsic partnership that I think needs to be more intentionally curated within organizations between communicators and designers. Now, I know that you also do interior design, you design spaces as well. So this could relate to how we put together our events, our all hands, you know, those kinds of, uh, you know, customer events or sales kickoffs and those kinds of things and when working with designers in having a more inclusive and representative space. And then there's the day-to-day -day, uh, relationship between going back to the all hands, how we put together, if we're internal communicators, the, uh, the, the company uh, deck, uh, culture deck. There's um, the videos that we do for recruiting and retention. There's this partnership that needs to be very intentionally curated and built upon trust, but also mutual understanding around 
our role as visual folks, as designers, as content creators, as communicators in setting a tone and being a role model for the organization around creating this inclusive workplace that's never existed before, right? right? So can you speak to that relationship and what is the role of designers, graphic artists, you know, videographers, those who are, are, are creating the visual experience with communications, with content creators? What does that partnership need to be? What kind of understanding and agreement do we need to have to really ensure that we are doing our best work on behalf of, of the organization and being kind of social change agents within our organization? I love that question because I think the, the main thing that needs to happen is that we need to understand that we're part of a team in creating a narrative. One ah, component ah. Visual, one component love it. Yes. And we have to get on that same page about what this narrative is. And to your point, open the dialogue about what are we, what is our overall message we're sending? If you have a disconnect between what is being portrayed visually and what the words are, or even how it's delivered, whether that, you know, if we have videos that don't have captioning, you know, if we have a web, we're creating a website that does not meet accessibility standards. We have to understand that this, it is a group effort. It's a team effort and we are storytellers, mm -hmm. whether you do it through design or you do it through words. Um, and we need to be conscious of the message that we're sending collectively and how, we, and how, we're, how we're delivering it. Um, and knowing that we also, we each, in, you know, in our own ways and in our own lanes, we own such critical parts of that overall story. And we have to make sure that they gel because I know collectively we all want the same, you know, the same outcome. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we have to be very, uh, we have to allow space for candor in crafting that, that story as well. Foster that learning environment. Definitely. And so you can have real conversations and real talk. That's something that Jess and I, Jessica and I can partner with on organizations that are listening to this. We can bring this to you. We can teach your, your, your team. We can embed it in your processes and systems so you don't make the same mistake as Walmart, Louis Vuitton. I mean, the list goes on. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is chapter six. It totally relates to what you were just talking about. And the title is Culturally Competent Design is Activism. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, it's <clears throat> I, I, I look at this work and the opportunities that, that DEI practitioners present across all, all uh, industries and all different facets um, as an opportunity to, to be an activist, to show up and to set the example, just like you were saying, to model the behaviors and to push, push our limits. <laughs> um, activists do that. That's that's what they're there to do: to challenge the systems, to challenge all of the the rules and the policies and the procedures that we have been living by for way too long, um, and be really willing to look at things and say, how can we do this differently? How can we show up differently? If we're saying you can't talk out of one side of your mouth and say we honor diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then it completely neglect it when you're That's right. talking about anything else. That's another thing I noticed actually in my design program. I was at an institution that talks about how diverse the student body is. Uh, you know, we're recognized for our international students, blah, 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 blah. And then you get in the classroom and you never acknowledge their background and you don't give them space to speak to their own experience. Uh -huh. Okay. That's, that's just, that can't happen. But um, off, I've seen, though, that it takes more than just one or two people's efforts. <laughs> that's why I use the term activism, too, because that's more about a collective effort. And it's an effort that is really looking to push the boundaries and looking to make things, like to shake things up in a major way. Um, and I present different ways to do that as individuals, as individual designers, but also as whole organizations. Um, so as individuals, it could be, you know, being that person who's willing to model the behavior, to ask the hard questions in the moment, um, to make sure that, you know, people are always going to make, mis make missteps. There's always going to be mistakes. No DEI, that's not the, the point of DEI is not to make people perfect. That's not going to happen. The point is to create the space where, the, where when things come up, they can be addressed in the moment. They will not fester. 
they can be treated with respect and candor and people can learn from them and we can keep going. All of that in parallel with also getting the historical context to know why that misstep was a misstep in the first place. Um, so for individuals to be willing to be the ones to lean into that, to say, I'm going to be the one to push back and pushing back isn't bad. <laughs> Um, or teaming up with either other, even other colleagues to say that we collectively are going to commit as a team to have the hard conversations. And we're not just going to wait for the moment to come up. We're going to say we are together going to get more educated about different backgrounds. Um, as organizations, uh, we're going to be the ones to say we will only participate in or sponsor, you know, such and such uh, industry conference if there's going to be representation from across many different backgrounds on your, on your panels, um, you know, among your keynotes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, being willing to use that clout to make an impactful difference um, and being willing to say, you know, as once again, especially if you have a, a real platform somewhere to introduce people of different backgrounds, to partner with them, not just to put them on the stage as like your little token, but to give them a place to talk about what they do and how they do it. And to even say, I'm not just introducing this person, I'm partnering with them. We are doing actual work together. We're going to talk about things that we do, conversations we've had and how we've created different outcomes as a result. So just being willing to take things like a step further. I think there's a lot of good intention out here, but there's not a lot of impact happening. And the activism is about really creating these impacts that have a, lasting effect so we can have a spinoff from this podcast and call it design like you give a damn and i think you just <laughs> put together <laughs> what that model looks like actually you have a blueprint that you introduce in the book so kind of give us give us an idea of what that blueprint is and what are we solving for when we put the, put that blueprint into action sure so one of the things i was thinking about um in incorporating identity into the design process I felt like it didn't need to mean that we completely just, uh, you know, obliterate the design process as we know it. The idea is to be more intentional about uh, intentional about incorporating identity, identity into the process as it exists and not just letting it be an afterthought or something that we, you know, check in on at the very end and have a focus group when everything's already been built, created, designed, approved, et cetera, et cetera. And the excuse can be, well, it will be too expensive to change at this point. Uh, yeah. um, so that was, a, you know, this was really the blueprint basically lays out the design process with different uh, questions to ask across the phases, questions to ask among design teams, and also questions to ask directly to customers to make sure that identity is baked into the whole conversation and the whole process. And it starts from the very beginning when we do first interact with customers, literally asking them, what about your identity? Would you like to be celebrated in this space, this app, this clothing line, et cetera? And really starting the dialogue from the beginning. Um, and that's, I mean, that can signal so much to customers. Number one, you're even asking. <laughs> yeah, I started... yeah, they even thought to. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it changes the whole dynamic of the, of the relationship. And design, the design process is a relationship. And mm -hmm. by bringing up identity and, and creating that space for it from the very beginning, you send that signal, yes, that we're listening. Now, mm -hmm. it's also important as you go through the process, and you'll see in the blueprint, there are deliberate... Uh, points in that process where we go back to the to the customers and say like are we getting this right <laughs> things become performative when we think we got it maybe even from one conversation and then it becomes the designer's interpretation of what the mm -hmm. customers thought was meaningful and this, you, there's going to be times that you as a designer are going to know more than the client in some of these areas and topics is that accurate and about certain aspects, but we do still owe it to the client. If we started this conversation about identity to go back to them and see if we're still getting it right. Or if our, okay. if, if our specialty, you know, and our, our expertise aligns with how they would like to see it executed and being willing to, to pivot if we, if we're getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about saying, oh, you know, we're, we're doing all the good in the world. We, we ask them the question. It's like, no. What are you doing with the information and are you making sure that that 
you know, that that conversation you started up front didn't just end there and that you, you don't end up with the final product where people are like, well, why do you even ask in the first place? There has to be that validation and that checking. And there has to be the checking among the design teams to even say, do we even have the right people in this process? Because there has to be some connection. You know, I mentioned this idea of creating this relationship with customers. They're going to connect automatically with people who have a shared experience, who have a similar lived experience. And they're, there, there's going to be a different kind of connection there <laughs> when people can talk about their own background with someone who gets it, as opposed to constantly feeling like they're just having to explain themselves to someone who like, you get like the, well, <laughs> you know, or kind of the blank stare. Like for those who are watching, it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll make a note right. of that. Sure. <laughs> And then they edit out everything that either makes them uncomfortable <laughs> or they don't understand. That's not business to work. <laughs> and, and I know when I've worked with designers, um, they'll come to me and say, hey, your content is going to drive what we design. And so putting it on communicators and content creators to have that DEI lens on our work from the beginning of a project is really key because that impacts the downstream of what the initial output and outcome becomes. Definitely. And that, that, that relationship cannot be ignored. That connection cannot be ignored there. It's, you can't have, just like we were saying, you can't have one component give, sending one, one message and another component sending one that completely contradicts it or just does not even come close. Like things that just look like, <laughs> Like, you know, complete strangers did this in complete different yes. levels. And, and we do see that, right? Together. We do see this, like, right hand, left hand, not knowing what each other is doing. Yeah, and, but the DEI, the DEI strategy of your organization can be that un uniting, you know, uh, force, you know, to bring visuals and copy together. Right, uh, and even just creating the space for the conversation. That's That's what we need to do. There's not going to be a recipe for every type of project or every type of demographic that you're creating for that we just need to get in the habit of having the conversation. What perspectives do we need in this? What perspectives are we missing from mm -hmm. this conversation, from this concept development and really being intentional about that? And that speaks to the E in the depth model of the conscious communicator. That's all about educate, you know, like, what do I need to be educated on? Who's missing from this? And, and, and that is, is really just a, another way of looking at inclusion, like looking, just like taking a pause and looking around and saying, um, only white people are putting together Juneteenth here on the internal comms department. Maybe we should be doing something a little different there, you know, just noticing, just, just taking a notice of that. Right and planning ahead. I, I really value and envy the talent of a lot of designers because <laughs> no one has ever told me, wow, Kim, your designs are amazing. Um, so that's why I always get help. <laughs> They've also never accused me of being amazing at project management. So, um, so I'm okay with that. And so I, you know, it takes everybody and I really do I genuinely appreciate the talent that designers bring to the world. I have an artistic, I have an autistic son and an artistic daughter and, and my artistic daughter, the way she sees the world, how she reflects it back in her drawings and really trying to foster that talent, which of course she's at the age of getting into being an adolescent where everything I say is wrong. I'm suddenly an idiot. Um, you know, I'll be smart again, as Mark Twain says, you know, by the time she's in her early twenties or late teens, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but also, you know, just the way, uh, you know, April is autism acceptance month and, you know, how my son experiences the world and what he brings to us and how he sees it. So just these, these various experiences of the world and how it's shared in ways that just enriches my, my experience and, and all the audience's experience of how to experience the world and other people's experience. I keep using the word experience a lot. Um, but, you know, what, what it really comes down to is we have to design like we give a damn and that we have to communicate like we give a damn. And communicators, content creators have to work closely in partnership, in relationship with designers 
um, and artists within our spheres and to listen and pay attention and look at our processes, our systems, and, <clears throat> and make the adjustments, do the hard work. We have no role models or we have terrible role models. This is a brand new kind of conversation that needs to happen within workplaces. But Jessica has your back in her book, Design for Identity, and certainly having communicators and designers working closely together. Let's get your teams together. Jessica and I can bring our expertise and our backgrounds and what we've learned with clients to your organization. So Jessica, how can people stay in touch with you? Sure. Um, people can go to my website, jessicabantam.com. Um, I'm also active on LinkedIn and Instagram, um, where you can just Google me for a uh, search for me under Jessica Bantam. Um, always love to connect, even if it's just, to, you know, for a quick exchange. Um, I always love to hear people's thoughts and experiences and their kind of reactions to the concepts that I share, too, uh, because, like I said, this is about expanding this dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way we can do that is we, if we actually just kind of lean in, dig in and just share our thoughts and work through all the mess together. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. I, I liken it to when I was in junior high or middle school, when I had braces and I was gangly and I had my feet were too big for my body and I kept tripping and it was just like awkward awkward time, the zits and everything. It's just like, that's where we're at. Or if you want to use the analogy of the caterpillar to the butterfly, we cannot, we, I think we collectively as a society, we can agree that we can no longer be the caterpillar and we're in the goo. We're in the goo stage, <laughs> but we're building our wings. We're building our strength, you know, to break out of that cocoon so we can really fly. And that's, that's the vision that really keeps me, you know, going um, in spite of everything that I see around me. Uh, but I am not confused with breakdowns and breakthroughs. I really see that where we're going from here is breakthroughs. And Jessica, your contribution to this work is exponential. And I can't wait to see more of what you will be doing to help organizations come into their full selves and designing for identity. Thank you for being with, with us today. Thank you Thank so you much. This was great. <laughs> so what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicate like you give a damn podcast.com and set up a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. And until next time, let's keep taking care of each other.